Good evening. Um, so the inscrutable Chung Su. Chung Su was known as the uh, marvellous Chinese conjurer or magician. Uh, this was his letterhead uh, paper. Yeah, this is kind of the, his imagery. Uh, you can see it was kind of all about exoticism. It was all about the visual and not actually much room on the page left to write anything. Um, actually there. Um, Chung Ming Su was very famous uh, in the kind of Edwardian, Victorian era. Um, it became famous in the UK around about 1900 um, for the next kind of uh, couple of decades, really. Uh, kind of contemporary of, of Houdini, but uh, obviously not as well remembered. Uh, now, the reason I'm kind of interested in this guy is because I grew up working in a, uh, in a Blackpool magic shop uh, surrounded by Chung Ling Su posters. Uh, this was a style of thing, I mean, quite interesting compared to most kind of musical type posters in the sense that it doesn't mention the venue, uh, the times, the dates, or anything like that. It's just the image. This is how famous he was. These have been plastered around town and people would just kind of, you know, find, assume it was the biggest venue in town and go and see him. Um, lots of beautiful posters. I'm going to whiz through these quite quickly because there's a lot of them. Uh, but they're just quite striking, really. Uh, we've got the kind of willow pattern plate thing there. We have the, the phrase, the, the marvellous Chinese conjurer. Uh, this was one of his particular um, sort of large-scale illusions that he invented himself. The birth of the pearl, where his, uh, his assistant, who's also his wife, uh, appeared from out of this empty oyster shell. He'd fill it with water, it closed, uh, opened up, and there she was. Um, there's... Um, no end of these, and the way they kind of used, they weren't used, just used a, uh, like a modern tour poster one at a time. They'd been plastered like lots of different ones, a dozen different ones over every available sort of space. Uh, that's him doing the marvellous ring trick, the Chinese linking rings, which you've probably never heard of. Um, and a little kind of like joking reference there is ten assistants, as in his ten digits, you know, it's like a hand thing. Although coincidentally he also had around about ten assistants on stage. I particularly like this one, um, I've actually got uh, an original of this particular one, um, which is him doing a, a, an illusion called the smoke jar, where it'd be a big glass jar with a lid, uh, totally empty, he'd cover it with a cloth, and then blow out a, a lit taper and waft the smoke towards it, and when he took the cloth off, the jar would be full, full of smoke there. So he did everything from kind of like um, smallish slight hand stuff to, to large scale um, illusions. And you see there's no end of these there. Um, this is another particular favourite one. Uh, it's got a great little kind of um, uh, slogan at the bottom. Spellbound they gathered far and near to scan the weird powers of this wondrous man. Um, and again, this is uh, one that I've got an original of at home. The landscape ones are slightly rarer, more unusual than the portrait ones. This was his assistant and, uh, and partner, Sui Sin, there. Um, and that's the, the two of them, two different posters uh, side by side. Um, but this is what he actually looked like. Now, the show, as I mentioned, was all about the kind of image. It was all about uh, very lavish curtains and sets and drapes and furniture on the stage, oriental rugs, uh, there was a big orchestra out front, lots of assistants, full Chinese costume there. Um, and the, you've got to imagine kind of in a time when people didn't have uh, TV or even uh, cinema at that point, uh, the visual from kind of Far East was kind of a particularly sort of, uh, you know, exotic and exciting thing to behold. And in fact, the magicians were the stars of the day compared to uh, even comedians or, or singers. Uh, it's before the days of amplification, obviously, electric amplification, so uh, a comic, you know, could hold his own on a stage, but work into a large theatre was quite difficult, just uh, technically. Uh, the same with a singer, whereas someone who had all the visuals going on kind of filled the stage, so that's why they were the big draw. Uh, and earn the money. This is kind of part of his kind of uh, sort of stage family, as it were. There, uh, he had a guy who translated for him, uh, who's the guy on the right there, um, uh, Sui Seen again, and um, he, that was actually his assistant's uh, daughter there, rather than his own. Um, there's that gives you an idea of the kind of costumes involved in the whole thing. You know, it was a pretty uh, elaborate spectacle, and he used to travel with kind of tons and tons of equipment. Um, either by truck or by rail uh, during the First World War uh, because of rationing of fuel, a lot more entertainers travelled by rail. So they actually duplicated all his equipment up in the north of England um, so that he could just, you know, him and his uh, assistants could travel as passengers and then uh, save transporting the gear around in trucks. Uh, this is a, an exhibit in the Magic Circle headquarters in London now and it's Chung Ming Su with his Chinese linking rings 
However, if you see through the poster, he's using about, I don't know, about a dozen uh, rings overall, whereas there are only eight in the case. Somewhere, there are four rings knocking about. This was one of his most famous tricks. I mean, he did things like, as I said, the birth of the pearl. Uh, he did a kind of version of fire eating where he stuffed cotton wool into his mouth and then blew sparks out of. He did a thing called aerial fishing where he had a fishing rod, a bamboo fishing rod, and he put a little bit of uh, bait on the end of it, a bit of rolled up bread or something, flick it over the audience, and a live goldfish would appear dangling uh, from that. He did a thing where he uh, made a giant bowl of water appear on stage from under his robes. Uh, I mean, it was a full evening show. He did everything, uh, anything from about 20 minutes uh, as a kind of top of the bill to a full hour and a half with his own show. Uh, this particular one was uh, one he became famous for, which was Condemned to Death by the Boxers, uh, which is uh, him doing a version of the bullet catch trick. Uh, you're probably aware of the catching the bullet in the mouth thing that several magicians have, have done over the years. Uh, he used to uh, catch the bullet, a lead shot that had been initialed by a member of the audience. He'd catch it on a willow plate, a willow pattern plate, in front of his chest, like you can see there. So, um, excuse me one second. Um, so, so, uh, so he was um, doing this particular trick uh, one night, um, and this is kind of the reason for doing this talk at this point uh, for me. Um, this was Wood Green Empire, a theatre in the north of London, um, on March the 23rd, 1918. So, a uh, hundred years ago, in two days' time. He was finishing the show, and he actually had two guys up on stage. The posters tend to exaggerate the kind of scale of things. Um, he'd asked for a couple of, uh, he'd asked if there were any Tommies in the audience. Um, you know, bearing in mind, this was uh, towards the end of the war. Uh, a couple of guys had, had got up, and uh, he asked one of them to mark a lead shot with his initials, or some identifying mark. Uh, this was carried back to the stage and loaded into a, uh, even for the time, an old-fashioned musket-loading rifle. Uh, the reason for using more than one rifle, man, was the old idea that if something goes wrong, then you don't know who to blame. You know, no one can, uh, can be held responsible for this thing. So the two guys were stood there with their loaded uh, rifles, and his assistant, because, you know, Chunling Su never really spoke on stage, um, his assistant would translate the odd line to the audience or give instructions. His audience shouted fire, sorry his audience, his uh, audience members with the rifles um, were told to uh, fire. As they did, Chung Ling Su collapsed to his knees and shouted out, my God, something's gone wrong. And the curtain dropped. Uh, backstage, he ended up uh, being wrapped in a, uh, a bit of back off curtain uh, as he was lying on the floor, shivering. Sui Sin, uh, his wife, was there to look after him. He got taken to hospital, and I think it was about sort of five or six hours later, he died. Um, the coroner's report was that it was, uh, he'd been shot in the lung. So, that was the interesting thing, him shouting out. Well, obviously, yeah, interesting apart from being shot <laughs> on stage. <laughs> but it was the fact that he shouted out, something's gone wrong, in what was apparently a kind of slightly American, slightly <laughs> Scottish accent. <laughs> And it turns out that Chung Ling Su was none other than this guy uh, without the moustache. This is a guy called William Ellsworth Robinson. And William Ellsworth Robinson had been born in New York to Scottish parents in 1861. And uh, his father owned a music hall, uh, come knocking shop, apparently. Um, and as a young boy, his father being a a musician and singer, um, he got into show business. His passion was magic, but he wasn't particularly good at talking on stage, so he kind of cultivated what we'd call as a magician a, a silent act, so he won't work into music. Um, this was what the guy looked like um, on stage, just to remind you. Um, that's him in his kind of uh, daytime gear, and this is what he actually looked like. This is probably the last known photograph of him here. So the story behind William Ellsworth Robinson is that he worked in America as an assistant to other magicians. He was also building himself as Robinson Man of Mystery, uh, but never had any great deal of success, apart from the fact that he was very good at inventing tricks and illusions and building apparatus. And uh, so he ended up working for a very famous uh, magician who was actually French, but famous in America, uh, Herman the Great. And when you see magicians who've got the, that particular goatee and the moustache, 
uh, that kind of look. That's where it comes from. He's the sort of original Mephistopheles kind of character. And so um, our friend um, Billy Robinson worked for him. And you can see here, this is where the influence came from, for the bullet catch. This is Herman the Great doing Herman's marvellous bullet catching feat. Probably a good, I'm thinking, probably at least 40 years before Robinson was killed on stage doing that himself. This other guy on the left here uh, is Harry Keller. Harry Keller was another famous uh, American magician, very big name at the time. He was, you know, probably the biggest name in magic. Um, and Billy Robinson ended up kind of playing Herman and Keller off against each other, so he ended up working for him. And you kind of get the idea that he was sort of taking his own invented illusions and going, I can offer you this in the show, you know. So he would act as an assistant, but also supply the props, and also act as a support act as well. Um, so Keller, um, who had a, a famously bad temper, would always end up in these rows with Herman, and not, neither of them realised they were being played off by the Robinsons. Um, the guy on the right, incidentally, is not Chung Ling Su, this is Ching Ling Fu. <laughs> uh, Ching Ling Fu was a genuine Chinese magician, and he'd become known in the States in the sort of late 19th century, and he was famous for kind of two or three main tricks that he did. He had a full supporting cast of support acts, he had kind of jugglers, and he had people who'd swing around from a, a, a rope attached by their hair, all sort of weird and wonderful stuff. Uh, but his famous thing was producing the giant bowl of water from underneath his robes, you know, which apparently weighed uh, 90 pounds. Uh, so he became known for this. Um, Robinson, uh, in the meantime, was working as a support act for these guys, Keller and Herman, but he was doing it under various guises, one of them which was Ahmed Ben Ali, where he pretended to be an Egyptian uh, magician, um, and he'd actually nicked that idea from a guy called Ben Ali Bay, uh, who was actually German. <laughs> so there, there wasn't a lot of ethics in terms of performance going on here. Chung Ling Su issued a challenge to uh, Chung Ling Su once he became known that he couldn't duplicate his feet. And they ended up this kind of spat over several years where kind of challenges were offered, people didn't turn up apart from the press, they, they all got kind of coverage out of it. Uh, but he was the sort of genuine article that Robinson uh, kind of covered. Uh, this is uh, Ching Ling Fu, not Ching Ling Su, with Houdini. Houdini, bizarrely, was a friends with both of them. Houdini was a, a, a kind of, almost a protege of <coughs> Ching Ling Su of Robinson, because Robinson was about 13 years older than him, and so he used to turn to him for advice, all the rest of it. But here he's caught out fraternising with the enemy. Um, just thinking what his Christmas card list must have looked like. Right? Ching Ling, have we turned one to Chung Ling Ching Ching Chong Ching? No, we haven't. No, okay. um, this again is, is what uh, it looked like um, off stage in the, in the later years. Um, so going back to that kind of point where, I mean, actually the other thing I should mention is that Houdini and Chung Ling Su had a, another couple of things in common. One was with, uh, that they both uh, used to bust fake spirit mediums. They had an interest uh, in kind of, kind of the whole Victorian seance thing, and they used to go around debunking uh, uh, spiritualists. I was going to say fake spiritualists, but that's a tautology. Um, the, uh, the other thing they had in common is aviation, funny enough. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, but Houdini was the first guy to fly a plane in Australia. Um, and uh, there's another talk about uh, what happened to his plane after that. He came back to the UK, and I've been trying to trace what happened to it after that point. Uh, turns out that he actually signed it over to a guy, the last known document about his plane, he's signing it over to a guy called Donald Stevenson, who was Chung Ling Su's right hand man, bizarrely. So it's a whole kind of web of intrigue. The other thing is that um, Sui Si, of course, wasn't Chinese either. Um, her real name, well, not a real name, she was known as Dot. Um, her real name was actually Olive. And wasn't really his wife, because what happened was he'd originally got uh, married to a dancer, and when he left America, he'd gone off with his new assistant, uh, was Dot, um, Olive, um, so he couldn't marry her because he couldn't get a divorce, so they pretended to be married. Meanwhile, he was actually seeing someone else anyway, and it's all, it's what a, you know, tangled when we weave. So what happened that evening, I hear you ask? Well, there's, a, there's still kind of myths. If you look on, you know, it's the whole kind of conspiracy theory thing. If you look online, uh, there's all sorts of kind of uh, bits of footage of people going, well, you know, he, uh, he was having financial problems and that week he'd actually gone around sorting out his affairs. So maybe it was an elaborate 
form of suicide. And you know, that's a pretty elaborate form of suicide, you know, to do it on the stage. And uh, uh, doesn't explain why he was so surprised when, surprised when the actual event occurred. Um, others that kind of jealousy thing going on because um, Doc was actually living with his, um, his uh, chief assistant, who was actually, uh, his nickname was Frank. Uh, and here's a, uh, just as a side note, uh, when he used to do interviews with the press, Chung Ling Su would take along Frank as his interpreter to talk to the British press. <laughs> um, so basically, he'd get asked something in English, Frank, uh, he just makes some nonsense up uh, out to whatever Frank was saying, and then Frank would retranslate it back into nonsense, then into English, and answer for it. So there wasn't really much point in Chung Ling Su being there at all, being that he had no input to the conversation, in real terms. Um, the other thing is uh, why he ended up uh, in the UK. I mean, this was the thing, he was working in America, but he actually saw the success of Chung Ling Fu uh, in Europe, and he got a job um, at the Folie Bergère in Paris, and kind of built up the act there, and they had a chance meeting with a, an agent who told him he should work at the Hippodrome in London, which he did, and he ended up settling in Barnes um, in, uh, in uh, London, just by the Thames. Uh, and visited his, his house, and it was pretty impressive, you know, you have to realise that this guy was very, very famous at the time. So, this, um, what actually happened on stage that night was that, I mentioned that they were old-fashioned, kind of, uh, you know, muzzle-loading rifles which have a second barrel underneath uh, for holding a ramrod. And this was gimmicked up so that um, basically what happened was when the lead shot came back from the audience, it was surreptitiously switched. And so I won't explain how he got hold of the actual mark bullet, but the actual one, not a bullet, a shot, I should say, but the actual one that went in the, uh, the rifle was a duplicate. Um, the top barrel didn't fire. Uh, the bottom one did. The ramrod just had a blank charge in there with a bit of wadding. Uh, even firing a bit of wadding, though, from that could be dangerous, and so apparently when the guys came up from the audience, Frank would whisper over the shoulder, aim above his head, rather than the chest, you know? Because he'd been hit in the face a few times. On this particular occasion, uh, he'd been a bit kind of lapsed, a bit lazy, really, because he'd been using these old-fashioned rifles for a long time, uh, and got a bit complacent with it. And a little fracture had worked between the lower ramrod barrel and the actual main real barrel there, and so when the bottom charge fired, it leaked through to the top one and fired the actual duplicate lead shot as well, and that's what killed him. So this picture here is from a, a bit of footage, uh, and it's literally 14 seconds long this. There's a friend of mine in Brighton where I live uh, called Stuart McKay, and he's a researcher uh, for archive material for TV shows. And quite a few years ago, I think it's probably about, I don't know, maybe uh, 10 years ago or more now, he was doing some research for a BBC programme uh, that was just called Magic, and it was a very in-depth history of magic and magicians, and it had a different theme each week. And he was looking through a load of old kind of VHS cassettes which had been taken from Pathé newsreels and things like that. And uh, he just had to leave it on, and he kind of found this little clip at the end, I had no idea who the guy was and all the rest of it, so I did a bit more research, and he actually discovered the only known footage of Chung Ling Su, literally the only known bit. And it's of him during the First World War, meeting um, up with some uh, injured soldiers for a charity fundraiser um, for, that, uh, for that purposes. So I'm going to show you this now, so bear in mind, uh, you know, it's quite a kind of poignant that it's in this kind of lovely theatrical setting. Um, it's a hundred years uh, in two days' time since he was shot on stage. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the inscrutable Chung Ling Su. What about? <laughs> so that's about it, really. Just, uh, just thought it'd be nice. I've got a kind of uh, interest in historic magicians, and as I say, I kind of grew up in a, a magic shop with these posters. In fact, let me just tell you quickly where those posters came about. I, I worked in a magic shop uh, called the House of Secrets when I was a kid, um, and it's in Blackpool on the promenade. Or it was on the promenade, and um, my kind of mentor, my sort of lifelong friend until he died five years ago, was a guy called Bill Thompson who ran the place. And when Bill took over this, I was a 13 year old when I started working there. Um, and uh, the warehouse where he used to buy the jokes and tricks from 
was owned by a guy called Paul Clive. And Paul Clive's claim to fame is he, he's the guy that sold um, Harry Corbett, the original Sutton puppet, on the North Pier in the Magic Shop in 1949. And uh, when uh, this guy retired, uh, Paul Clive, he, he basically sold on the warehouse, the, the wholesalers of the Joke and, and Magic Supplies, to a guy who had already been working for him, um, known as Canadian Dave. And this guy who had taken over the place, uh, kind of, uh, he had a clear out, and Bill went around to buy some stuff, and he said, actually, while you're here, I know you're into the magic stuff, there's a load of stuff out the back I'm just throwing out, so if there's anything you want there, just help yourself to it, you know? And out the back, there was literally a dustbin an old-fashioned kind of zinc uh, metal dustbin with six original rolled-up chumling Sioux posters in there. So Bill had them framed and he had them uh, at his house where he stayed and all the rest of it. And uh, they kind of stayed with me through my life and I now own two of them, which is lovely. Um, so it's kind of got a special place in my heart from that point of view. But I've always been interested in the kind of whole history of, of, of magic and the rest of it. Because I think in terms of social history, we hear about politicians, we hear about people who are murdered or people who are murderers, we hear about royalty, but actually the stuff that really affects day-to-day -day people, uh, you know, this was their escapism, was seeing the marvellous Chinese country, the country that was kind of this, um, I mean, in fact, you know, it probably wasn't that much of a secret that he was, wasn't Chinese, but people didn't want to know that, they just wanted an hour of, of escape in the same ways that kids, you know, in the 70s, 80s are now going to see a Star Wars movie or whatever it may be. Um, and, you know, with Ken Dodd uh, kind of passing recently, who's someone I was, I was lucky enough to work with, you kind of realise how important these so-called light entertainers are in affecting people's kind of career choices and lifestyles in general. So, uh, that's it. Chung Ming Su. Thank you so much, Paul. How good was that? So uh, this very Friday, 100 years, and uh, Chung Ming Zhu's, the centenary of his... Is the centenary being shot? He actually died on the 24th, kind of overnight. Okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shot on the 24th. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Paul. That was a fascinating, fascinating talk. Now, at this stage, uh, I throw it open to questions. So does anybody... Yes, I can see hands waving. I'm going to come dashing in here like Jeremy Kyle. Uh, <laughs> What happened to the two Tommies who, uh, did either of them get charged or...? Uh, no, uh, not at all, because they, it was, it was kind of explained within the kind of context of the show what was going to happen, that they wouldn't be held responsible. Um, they gave statements, of course, to the, to the police when there was a, an inquest, uh, but, but not, nothing kind of uh, negative happened to them, because they were just doing what they were asked to do, and, uh, you know, it was no, no fault of theirs, really. Excellent. Any other any other questions? I say Jeremy Carr, I think more Kilroy Silk actually. <laughs> With less hair. Does anybody have any you should talk more about, about these kind of uh, affairs and relationships and children out of wedlock, that's more Jeremy Carr. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> any other any other questions for um the Paul? There's actually one thing, Paul. When was the last time the trick was done? Well the bullet catch yeah. um, is still done by notably by Penn and Teller in the States. Uh, they don't do it nightly in their uh, kind of uh, Leo Vegas show, but they do do it from time to time when they tour. Uh, so that's still going on. Uh, I saw someone do a version of it uh, probably only about a month ago. There's a big magician's convention in Blackpool every year, uh, where it's, it's the biggest one in the world, oddly enough. There's like 4,000 magicians turn up for this thing. Uh, and a guy who specialises in kind of dangerous stunt-type magic uh, did a version of it with paintballs, but it doesn't sound that dangerous. But he did it with a kind of a, a, a steel ball bearing in the same diameter. And the way the trick worked is that he had a sheet of glass in a mount. Uh, someone marked the, uh, the steel shot, uh, the steel ball bearing, and they loaded it in the container with all the paintballs. And it was a great visual, actually, because he stood behind it. And so what you got for like this five second burst were a hundred paintballs splattered against the glass and then the steel one coming through it and then him scraping it out, you know? Uh, so it's a nice version. But I think, as far as I know, 13 magicians have been killed with variations of the catch and the bullet trick uh, in about 150 years. Um, it, you know, it, it's, there's no safe way of doing it. David Blaine is, is currently doing a version where it's a bit of an odd one because he's got a kind of resin shot glass sized cup that he holds in his mouth to catch the thing in all the rest of it. And he had a, a bit of an accident with that, but you're never quite sure whether 
the accident to just to generate more publicity or, or whatever it is. But it's, you know, it's um, Houdini, funnily enough, was going to do the trick and he got persuaded not to by Keller, um, the guy I mentioned before, on the basis that it had killed too many people and at that point it had just killed Chung Ling Su. So it's exactly the sort of trick that Houdini would have done, but even he thought better of it. So uh, next month at the Bavar Bar, the... <laughs> Is that okay, Alden? <laughs> any, any other questions? For, yes, down. Yeah, do you want the mic? Come on. Yeah, obviously you talked about the, the trick that killed him, so I've got big love. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favourite trick that he used to do? Well, bearing, yeah, tricks fine, yeah, yeah, the, the way, because uh, a lot of people kind of get to mix up sort of tricks and illusions, the, 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 in general magician's context, when you say an illusion, it generally refers to a bigger box trick, you know, a, 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 a trick that involves a person, uh, you know, getting cut in half or, um, <laughs> or, or, or penetrated or whatever, that sounds totally wrong. Um, <laughs> But um, took me about trimming spikes through things like that. Um, so um, it, it's hard to say what, what my favourite uh, trick of children's films would be, bearing in mind that I'd never seen him do any. Um, I would love to have seen the bowl of water thing. So although it sounds like a really basic thing, it's kind of it's apart from anything else, it's the weight involved, you know. And obviously they were both Ching Ling Fu, who kind of it probably wasn't his originally either. He probably brought it from elsewhere. But the, you know the idea that they were wearing long robes. Obviously, comes it to a certain extent, but just the idea of, of using uh, misdirection to, to you know, if, if, if someone was uh, you know walking with a bowl of water between the legs, which was two feet diameter and weighed ninety pounds, you think you might notice before it appeared. You know, uh, so I'd love to see how they actually stage that. Uh, but also, so there's a very kind of sad tale in a way that uh, you know I mentioned about uh, Chung and Sue's equipment being duplicated and stored up north. It was stored in a warehouse in Bolton. I tried to track down this warehouse a few years back and I uh, eventually found where it was and then found online that it had been demolished like 30 years ago. Um, but there's a guy, um, I'm trying to remember his name now, um, is it Lamont? Uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, Delay, sorry. Um, so Peter Delay was the name of um, a kind of, well, I'm not sure whether it was his name or his son's name, but basically this guy was doing a pantomime in the Bolton area and heard about the fact that Chung Ling Su had stored his stuff. But this is 1960s, I think, late 60s, something like that. Uh, so it had already been stored there for 40 odd years at that point, or thereabouts. And he went in there to see the, uh, the manager of the place and sort of said, I've heard you've got a load of stuff. He said, I'm, you know, I'm a big kind of fan of magic history and all that Is there anything that I might be able to take away as a souvenir? And the guy, who was called Percy Rivington or something like that, uh, said, you know what, lad? If you take that stuff, you can have the bloody lot of it. And it was 16 tons of equipment, which he transported in a, a rail carriage, or possibly a couple of rail carriages, down to Northampton where he lived. And I managed to track down, um, uh, I think it was the, his granddaughters, who basically, uh, the guy who was in the panto, who was a comedy magician, his son became a TV scriptwriter. Um, and I, through looking through his obituary, I found out that his daughters lived in Brighton, of all places, where I did. So I tried to meet up with them. They weren't kind of too keen on that. So they probably thought I was just after finding it, which I was. Um, and, uh, but they did say that they didn't remember anything kind of vaguely oriental looking around the house or anything like that. Uh, turns out I met someone else who's based in Northampton and they, they'd heard the story that a lot of the equipment, the, like the Birth of the Pearl, for example, uh, that thing, was burnt in his back garden because there was nowhere to store it. So when you think that one of those posters now is worth round about a couple of thousand pounds, um, and there's 16 tons of his stuff, you know, um, I'll do a bit more digging, but you know, it'd be, it'd be, uh, it'd be lovely to just find an artifact, you know. Um, I think David Copperfield, who collects everything magic based so no one else gets a bloody look in. Um, he's got a museum in Las Vegas where he's got all stuff and I believe he's got one of the rifles. I don't know what it's the, I don't know if he knows whether it's the actual one that shot him or whatever, but that's stored there. There's a costume at the Magic Circle headquarters uh, and the Lincoln Rings and a few other bits, one of the plates and all the rest of it, but actually very little survived sadly. Yeah, any other, yes. But how did, he, how did he get away with it? Because he doesn't even look remotely Slightly Chinese. Well, yeah, yeah, you say you say that, but if you if you have a quick look, let me just um, very quickly whiz back 
to, bearing in mind this is the days before Photoshop, uh, and most people uh, in the UK would never have met a Chinese person. Uh, what they would have seen at that point is possibly an illustration of a Chinese person, uh, possibly a, a grainy photograph in a newspaper, uh, but also I think it's important to realise that they probably weren't that interested in the fact that he wasn't Chinese, because it wouldn't be a scandal. Uh, they would, uh, you know, and it's also, in terms of you know, that thorny subject of cultural appropriation, uh, he was actually presenting the Chinese character in a very positive light. It wasn't a, a caricature to any great extent. If it was a caricature, it was the fact that the Chinese were skillful and graceful, um, you know, that things were beautiful to look at in their world, you know, so it was a, a kind of positive. So I think people just kind of went along with it. Obviously, people like the stage managers of people would, would know. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. Um, maybe it's a bit like the press now don't run negative stories about Britain's Got Talent. Uh, because the, uh, the Britain's Got Talent TV company, uh, Psycho Management, uh, basically threatened to not let them have all the little nuggets and stories of the good stuff if they start running negative things about it. You know, it's kind of, um, so it's a, a, a PR thing really. I mean, he would be paying the publicist, I assume, and so all this kind of information will be out there about the marvellous Chinese country. Why would you argue with that, you know? And on, on top of which, he's playing big theatres, so you've got gaslighting, footlights, and you're a long way away, and everybody on stage wore heavy makeup. So who's to say, you know, what look real? And he went to the trouble of, you know, shaving his head and having a pigtail and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, to, to us now it's really obvious, particularly when you see the moving footage. But people then, apart from that clip, wouldn't have seen any moving footage. You know? Any any final questions before we uh, before we take a we take a break? Yeah, there's one. Yeah. Um, Colin Firth, Woody Allen film the other year. Yeah. So, I'm glad you mentioned that, funny enough, because we were just talking about that down, down here. And, uh, um, and I, uh, I, I was checking when it was and whether it was his last film and all the rest of it. I was, and then I forgot to mention it, so I'm glad you did. Uh, Magic in the Moonlight uh, was a Woody Allen film about four years ago, apparently. Now we've looked at it, you know. It. Um, but I, I was saying, was it his last film? It was actually five ago. Um, and it's basically a story that is based on uh, Chung Ling Su and Ching Ling Fu, oddly enough, because it's got, it's got that bowl of water production thing in there. Um, and it's basically, the, the lead character in it is um, a, a white Caucasian guy who's impersonating a Chinese guy, but he also is into busting spirit mediums. Um, so what they've actually done in terms of the character in that film is they've taken Ching Ling Fu's act, as Chung Ling Su did, the idea that he's not really a Chinese guy is Chung Ling Su, but his off-stage character is actually Houdini. So it's kind of a weird thing, but what I quite like about that film is the magic segments of it are kind of filmed as they would have been performed, we assume. It's quite a lot of time, you get films where it's like um, The Illusionist or things like that, where they'll just use camera trickery to reproduce a Victorian or Edwardian magician on stage. So it's like, oh well, we'll close the cabinet door and then we'll cut away to the other. When we cut back, she's vanished from the cabinet. And you know, that's just, you know, that doesn't work. So they actually hold all the shots so you can see the magic being performed as it would have been, which is quite nice, you know. Um, so yeah, it's, it's worth, if you're into this sort of thing, it's worth a look. It's, it's quite a lightweight film, but it's quite fun. Uh, but yeah, Magic in the Moonlight. It's cool. Brilliant. Magic in the Moonlight. Fantastic. Um, right, well, I'm going to uh, stop there. Can we just thank Paul again?